Good afternoon. This is my first time in Thailand. It's been fantastic. I was walking the streets of Bangkok yesterday with my friend Luke, and uh, when I was reflecting on it today, I saw some interesting similarities between my experience walking the streets and the WordPress community and ecosystem. First, there was a lot of people, which is awesome. Uh, there was, uh, like, we went to these little side streets. There was this, what I would describe as this kind of, kind of organized chaos to it, where everything kind of had a good place and purpose, but, like, if you didn't pay close attention, it could be a little disorienting at times. Um, all sorts of food, too, which is fantastic. And there were several instances where I found myself... Um, kind of not sure where I was, kind of lost, and it didn't bother me. We were having a great time. I think that well describes uh, how it can feel in the WordPress ecosystem at times. I, I have three things that I'm hoping to do in our next couple of minutes together. I'm hoping to expand your context for the WordPress ecosystem, um, talk, talk about what it is, uh, we'll talk about business models, we'll talk about some of the characteristics, and my hope is to just give you a little bit broader sense of the size and shape and scale of the space. I want to inspire you with some possibilities for ways to do business better in the WordPress ecosystem, and then offer some hopeful, hopefully uh, actionable insights on things that you can do to take advantage of the things that you're learning. Now let's, let's get into it. So the WordPress ecosystem uh, is decentralized, which is a, a fantastic and key attribute of it. Uh, there are, and I like to divide into three main categories. You've got hosting providers, you've got your service providers and your product companies, and a couple of numbers that um, many of us know but may not be obvious or can be easy to sort of miss the scale of it. There are, according to builtwith.com, 38 million live WordPress installs, that's a lot. Uh, that's, and that's just the ones that it counts as live at the moment. By my best sort of current estimates, there are more than 5,000 hosting companies that serve those 38 million installs. There are more than 10,000 product companies uh, by a couple different definitions, but there's a lot that both either directly or indirectly serve the WordPress ecosystem and easily over 100,000 service providers, the freelancers, uh, agencies that uh, build build on WordPress. That's a lot. And it can be easy, so coming to an event like this is fantastic. You can get a sense of the size of it, but still, this is only a very small piece. It can be very easy to miss like just how big WordPress is. And a large part of that is because it's decentralized. You can uh, have WordPress with a hosting company, for instance, and be there, or you can move and have a very different experience somewhere else. There's a lot of freedom. It can be easy to sort of lose sight, though, of how big it is. All right, so let's talk about business models. The way that I think about a business model, it's a, it's a way of describing value, uh, how you can create value, rather, and ideally uh, generate a return on your investment. So this is your way of saying, okay, I have a particular audience, this is how I think I can create value for that audience, and this is how I'll get a return on that through a, a revenue model. And ideally, you increase the value over time. Now, there are a lot of different uh, business models and a lot of different ecosystems. In the WordPress ecosystem in particular, I've found that there are five key characteristics that matter most. So let's, uh, let's talk about those. First, you have the... Uh, type of plugin that it is. I'm going to just leave themes alone for a moment and focus on plugins and products in general. You have an ecosystem plugin. We'll talk more about that in a bit. You have your typical feature plugins, which are the majority that pr just introduce a new feature into, into WordPress. You also have integrations, which tend to be focused on software as a service, getting that connected to WordPress. So those are your three primary types. You have the audience, which um, most WordPress products are what we call B2C, they're consumer focused, they're focused on the end user, um, providing some additional functionality for them. Um, you can also have uh, very market specific audiences, maybe they're, you're focused on a particular type, a, tip, a typical vertical, maybe it's geographic, maybe it's a type of business. Next you'll have how you make money. 
We'll talk about the, those different ways in a moment. Um, distribution, how the product connects to its audience. And in a decentralized ecosystem, distribution is especially important. Uh, you have all these WordPress installs, but it's not to be taken for granted that you can actually reach your customers on them. And then last but not least is licensing. Uh, for the most part, uh, we're not going to get into that a whole lot today, but it is a consideration. GPL is the primary license that's, uh, that we believe in and practice in the space. There's other ways that you can do things as well. Let's, so uh, one of the things that I got to do, it was kind of fun, is do some research at some of the most popular plugins uh, on the .org directory, and I wanted to share some of that. So the top 100 plugins, as of earlier this week, 87 of them are what I've described as freemium or freemium plus, and I'll unpack that in a bit. Uh, 27 of them are owned or sponsored by a sp split between 10 different hosting companies, which I think is pretty interesting for a number of reasons. 12 of them are making use of the new uh, taxonomy to indicate whether they're uh, commercial or community, which I think is, is cool that that's happening. And 11 of them are owned by a single company. That company is not automatic, which is interesting. Uh, the freemium versus freemium plus, let me just touch on that for a moment. So most of your plugins in .org will have a, the free version, of course, and then it will encourage you to upgrade to pro. The freemium plus is a reference to what I would just describe as like other forms of monetization. So some of the plugins, for instance, will be advertising for services. So the plugin is entirely free. There's nothing to sell but they're, they're making additional money by paying for people to customize it, so, which is cool. But that's the majority of your top in the top 100, and I think you'll find that that extends. This is by far the, the most popular way of doing things, at least on .org. So next up, um, let's, let's dig into, across the ecosystem as a whole, let's talk about some of the most popular business models. First, you have your freemium which is the most po the, not only the most popular, but really the only option that you have available to you on .org. This is where you can provide initial value without requiring any money up front. They just install it, and it's useful or it's not. Your premium, where you pay for it before you get to use it, and your ecosystem plugins, where most of the users are indirectly monetized, and we'll talk more about that. Let's, uh, let's break them down a bit. And we're gonna talk about the benefits and trade-offs of each of these models. So your freemium, of course, uh, one of the, the key benefits is that's a low barrier of entry. Uh, most of the times you're just asking for time from your end user, and ideally as little as possible, right? You want them to be able to install it and get to value as quickly as possible. And it being free is a great way of reducing that friction. One of the things that, that I care a lot about and, and hope that you guys will get the benefit from is in this decentralized space, your most effective path to growing to getting distribution is gonna be through partnerships. And in general, when you've got a free uh, plugin, uh, it's less friction in negotiating partnership deals, right? Like it's, you can, it's easier to figure out a, a way, a, a win. Not always. Uh, and then of course, the, a big benefit is that you can get distribution through wordpress.org. Uh, which is fantastic, uh, but as we'll talk about on the trade-off side, let's just jump into it. Being on .org is no guarantee that you're actually going to get traffic, that people will find your plugin. There are more, like around 60,000 or so plugins there today, and it can be really hard to uh, cut through the noise on that. Some of the other trade-offs, if you focus on free, the product can end up being undervalued, and for you as the product creator, free can end up meaning you have a longer return uh, on your investment, right? You're taking more risk. Let's talk about premium. And of course, some good examples here. Uh, Yoast, Jetpack, Code Snippets, each of those have a strong free offering that provides a lot of value, and then they'll guide you to a, a pro offering. Premium is straightforward. The customer pays for value up front. Now, this is something that is prominent in our space, but isn't, we don't talk about it as much because premium plugins uh, just uh, by nature aren't listed on .org, so we often won't hear about them. Um, charging for something up front, it's interesting. We can get into a bigger discussion about what are you actually charging for, how does that work. 
But the point is that charging something up front tends to be a clearer way of aligning with value. So if someone's going to use it, they purchased it, and that's you know, just an obvious way for you to know that, okay, they, they see value in it, unless they ask for a refund, of course. Um, it gives you, and this is interesting, when you're talking about partnerships, if you've put a price on your product, it actually gives you a lot more value that you can offer when you're doing partnership deals. You might do a deal where a partner uh, includes your product in a bundle, and they're covering the cost of it, right? And the more expensive, uh, the higher the price is on your product, the more value, in theory, you're able to offer in those partnership deals. And, of course, it gives you predictable, sustainable revenue potential. Not guaranteed, but you have that potential uh, for, for the revenue. Uh, the trade-off, of course, is that you have a higher barrier of entry. You have more complexity when it comes to partnership negotiations. Uh, there's more things to consider if you haven't really sort of sorted that through. And um, in general, this is the big one, you limit access to your full addressable market. Um, there's less, like if you don't have a clear strategy for getting the word out, you tend to just, you tend to have a much smaller install base when you focus on premium, and including especially on wordpress.org. Uh, and the key when it comes to premium, just, just jumping on this for a moment, if you go for this, from what I've seen work, and my, my guidance on it is that you really want to make sure that you you sell it as much as you can before you make it. Like that you understand your audience, that you're clear on what problem that you are solving for them and that you verify with them uh, explicitly or implicitly that it's actually something that they want. And uh, when you put a price on it, that's a really good way of, of uh, finding out. They either are willing to pay for it or they're not. All right. Now I'm going to talk about the, the ecosystem plugin, uh, which is... Uh, it is my favorite. Um, this is something that, uh, let's just kind of unpack and talk about what this is. So the way that I define an ecosystem plugin is that it starts with a suite of functionality for a specific audience. It's more than just a feature. So it brings a whole new set of functionalities to WordPress. It provides an integration layer. So some way, an API for additional functionality that's, <coughs> that's uh, used by others other than the product creator. So you're thinking about third parties who would come in and create additional functionality for your plugin. And then for you as the product owner, uh, the, other, the other key characteristic is that you're able to shape and influence your ecosystem over time and align incentives amongst the participants. Uh, I've, you can, if you go to my blog, you can find more about this. I kind of unpack it in different ways. But these are the key so three definitions for me of what makes an ecosystem plugin. And the context of business models, the, uh, a great example of this is WooCommerce. Uh, you can install WooCommerce for free, and WooCommerce, the business, is able to monetize in a bunch of different, different ways. So you have upfront and long-term alignment with value. So it's free, they can get some initial value. And ideally, if you have a strong, healthy ecosystem around your product, the, the value is able to increase as time goes on. <clears throat> um, for you as the, the product and the business, that compound value, there's, a com there's that potential for compounding the value as the ecosystem expands. The more third parties that you have creating within your ecosystem, the more value that you're able to provide to the end user in theory, and the more value and the more return you're able to receive on your investment. And of course, there are multiple ways that you can get that. Um, the trade-offs. So an ecosystem plugin typically has higher upfront costs, um, not just development. There tends to be a lot of other things you have to put around it. There's greater risk as well. There's more complexity as your stakeholders increase. And it's, uh, I've, in my experience so far, <laughs> that there tends to be more difficulty in managing revenue streams. Sometimes, for instance, you'll have something that's making money uh, but, is, but can get more attention than it probably should relative to other parts of the ecosystem that uh, are creating a lot more value. So there's some, some interesting trade-offs. Uh, a few other things. When I think about an ecosystem plugin, uh, a key piece to it is you want to have an addressable market where you have a shot at achieving you know, like ubiquity. Uh, in general, I'd say like less than 500,000 installs. Uh, it's probably just not like 500,000 is probably the minimum uh, installs in WordPress for it to you have the start of an of an ecosystem plugin. It depends, of course, on what uh, particular vertical that you're focused on. Um, but the idea with this is that you uh, 
focus on providing that value, getting the install base uh, nice and, and wide, and then you monetize the majority of your users indirectly. Um, there's different ways you can do that. WooCommerce, for instance, monetizes indirectly through WooCommerce payments. You don't have to charge. They don't. You don't have to pay anything to use it. If you use it and you're successful, they're taking a piece of that. Um, excellent. So, uh, what I want to touch on next. So these are. Okay, so these are your different. These are the most popular business models. There's other ways of doing things, but in terms of what we're seeing work well in the space, uh, these are your your three primary. And as you're thinking about what to do, one of the, the mistakes that I see commonly is, is trying to do a little bit of both or just not being clear on which business model you're using. Uh, these three have complements, but they're, I, I would argue that they're fairly mutually exclusive. If you're going to focus on premium, for instance, and let's say, let's say your product is a premium product today, and you see that you have the attributes of an ecosystem plugin, Continuing to charge for the product up front is going to tend to be a limiter to growth, right? Like you're going to have a hard time growing the install base, which then limits how much value that you're able to provide to the ecosystem. So that ends up being a key strategy choice. Are we creating the ecosystem plugin? Do we have the, uh, do we have the, uh, are we thinking about third parties and what they're going to need to be able to build into it and expand on it? And are we doing the things that we need to to increase the install base so that we have that value for our users and for the people building within it? Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for more of these to exist. Uh, not everything should be that. Some things are, this is just a feature. There is no community going to be built around this. Um, but I think there's a ton of potential there. Um, so. I've think, been thinking about, one of the things I wanted to give you as well is just a couple of ideas for things that uh, we think could be explored more uh, in the space. So just a couple of, of concepts to consider. First, uh, one of the areas that we're seeing a lot of opportunity is in what we describe as the, the B2B. At this point, if you think about those 5,000 plus hosting companies, 10,000 plus product companies and all the extenders, all the, uh, all the uh, service providers, those are a lot of businesses that also need, uh, have things that they need, a lot of problems that you can help solve for them. And at this point, there's more than enough to have an entire business focus on just doing that. So th as you're thinking about your opportunities, uh, my, my guidance here is just to recognize that B2B versus B2C is just very different. And one of the mistakes that I've seen more commonly is businesses that have clear B2B potential, uh, but they're still acting like a consumer-focused uh, business in, in their pricing and how they structure things. So there's a lot of opportunity there, and that opportunity exists because of just how, how large the space is now and continuing to grow. So I think uh, that's something to be thinking about. Um, the world of SaaS, software as a service, is really interesting, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to bring more of that into WordPress. Uh, there are, one of the things we're seeing now is more software as a service companies building integrations for WordPress, which is great, and I, and I want to see more of that. For those of you already in the space, I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about ways that an external service could provide value. The key, though, is just not force it. I've seen products where it's like, okay, this is a pretty light attempt to add a uh, SaaS component to it, and it's like, no, this is functionality that really belongs inside of the Word, WordPress admin. But... There is a lot of opportunity there, something to consider. Uh, and crowdfunding is interesting. Um, one of the, going back to this idea on, what I mentioned on the premium, if you choose an audience and you've found a clear problem to solve, one of the ways that, uh, that you might be able to go about it is to ask them to help fund you in solving that, pro that, that problem. Um, there are some great community spaces in WordPress and going in there and sharing your hypothesis about uh, a problem and saying, hey, this is something that we think would be useful and seeing if people are interested, uh, that can be a good way to, to build into that. Excellent. All right, so what I want to touch on next, uh, I want to just offer a couple of pieces of guidance for, uh, for product companies who are trying to grow in the WordPress space. Um, the first thing I'm going to touch on is how to look at your product. Uh, it's important to evaluate your product as objectively as possible. We'll talk about some factors in a moment. Um, I, I want to, I think there's a lot of potential to grow through partnerships. We'd love to see you guys doing that. And it's important to be connecting with other founders. Uh, WordCamp is a great place to do that. 
And in our space as a whole, people are very willing to share. There's a lot of insights that we can gain. We have that open source mindset, and I'd love to see people taking more advantage of that. So let's take a look at each. So as you're thinking about your product, these are the things that I think are most important when you're assessing whether or not you're ready to grow uh, in the WordPress space. First is how customer-centric that you are. What, whatever type of plugin that you are, uh, that's, that is a, a key piece. Are you focused on solving a problem for a specific audience? This is where I see uh, folks make the most mistakes. They've built some cool technology, but it's not clear what value that they're actually creating for anyone. It's important to make sure that you keep your messaging, your product, and the partnerships that you build focus on solving a problem for a clearly defined customer. That's the biggest mistake that I see, is like, hey, this is cool, but we don't know what customer that we're serving, we don't know what problem we're solving for them. And I'll ask product founders, can you point me to some clear wins? Some have them, it's awesome. They can point me to a customer that they've created value for, others can't, and that to me is a sign that it's not ready to grow. Uh, the next is that the plugin works well with others, especially if you're playing in any other ecosystems in the space. Uh, if your product, for instance, um, it is, touches WooCommerce, you want to make sure that it works really well with WooCommerce and within the most prominent uh, extensions within the WooCommerce space. Um, it's important here, it, it's a lot of work, uh, quite frankly. Uh, but it's important to be planning, and, and especially in a de decentralized ecosystem, it's a lot of work because there's a wide range of standards, a lot of ways that things can get done. Um, but I suggest that it's worth the effort. And the key here is to be proactive, making sure that your product remains compatible and that you react well to customer feedback. They'll tell you when things aren't working. Take that seriously. It's an opportunity. It might be frustrating to hear about a, a plugin that doesn't work with your plugin, but that's a great opportunity to... Uh, make it work well together, and that maybe, maybe that's the start of a partnership. Um, make sure that you align, that your whatever business model that you pick, whether it's freemium, premium, uh, ecosystem, or something else, aligns with the value that you're trying to create uh, for your customer and for your partners. Um, I've seen, uh, yeah, on the partnership front alone, uh, making sure that you've thought ahead to how your partners are gonna be able to, to get a return on their investment is key and making sure that your model, your pricing reflects that. Uh, leadership is just making sure that you have the, uh, the right team behind the product. Uh, one of the mistakes that I'll, I'll see folks make is just not thinking ahead to what growth is gonna look like. Do they have the resources necessary to support that growth? Uh, partnerships alone, if you start going into the partnerships route, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have someone who can take care of those relationships because um, in the WordPress space especially, they're often going to be quite different. They're going to require time and effort to, to really get right. And then last, and this is one of my favorites to talk about to folks coming into the space. If you're not inside of WordPress already, it's very easy to take for granted for those of us who've been in here a long time, uh, just how, how important and, and how intimidating at first it can be to get involved in the community. But this is a big thing. If I'm looking at a product and placing a bet on whether it's gonna do well in the space or not, I pay attention to are they investing in community. Uh, that starts by going to WordCamps, uh, which you guys are, are doing, it's fantastic. Getting involved in sponsoring. If you can't sponsor one of the big ones, get involved with some of the smaller ones and, uh, and make those investments in the space. On the partnership front, so this is uh, what I call the product growth loop. And this is just something to, nice and simple. Uh, my suggestion, if you feel like your product is ready, find some partners that share the audience that you're sharing, that, that you're focused on, and that align with the problem that you're trying to solve and decide to, to work together. And, and this is the key that I found because this can, get very, can be very easy to get uh, overwhelmed with the details and the things to figure out. Focus on a first win. Uh, find uh, a customer that you can work with together. And sometimes it's literally just finding a customer or two that you can create a win for and that you can affirm that your hypothesis is good, that there's an alignment there, and then, and then talk about it. Uh, figure out a way to, you know, in both of your channels, talk about the win and, and keep it focused on the customer. That's the key. Like I've seen people announce partnerships, but it's like, so what? Like what value does this partnership can actually create? What we want to see is that those partnerships are solving problems for the end users. Uh, and then what I find is that it's a loop. You do that and then start another partnership. Go back to the first, 
find the next win, talk about it, and just keep doing that. And that's what I find is most successful in this space. It's decentralized, there's not one clear space place to go to, so you find your partners, you work together to find some clear initial wins, you talk about them and you, let, uh, you build on that momentum. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I think it's really important to be connecting with other founders. Uh, go to WordCamps, that's a, a great place to start. Uh, and, and participate in the community spaces. You have your wordpress.org Slack if you're not already there. Post status is great. There's smaller sub-communities like WP Minute, which are fantastic. Build those relationships. Uh, one of the things that I've been spending time with these days is the idea of accelerators. There's a few starting to be in the space. Take a look at those. You might be able to get additional resources that, uh, that are necessary. And uh, yeah, this, and what I've found in the WordPress space in particular is that people are, are quite willing to share. They're quite open and I think that's a, a big part of why many of us are still here after all these years and excited to, to be at WordCamps again. Uh, that's uh, what I've got so far. I'd love your questions. Thank you. <laughs>